My wife, Abby, especially loved watching movies. To please her, it was enough for me to take her to a good movie. But it couldn't just be a movie. It had to belong to one of four genres. Animation, action, adventure, drama, or romance. She especially liked romantic films, which were often called girly. Abby also preferred films starring actors such as Tom Torino, Matt Wright, or Brad Talbot, who were her favorites. Our first date was when I took Abby to see the movie Sleepless in Seattle. She wasn't particularly fascinated by Tom Hanks, but she really liked the plot. Years later, she confessed that she fell in love with me after watching this movie. The reason for this is not entirely clear to me. Even after 12 years of marriage, Abby remains as stunning as ever. With her tall stature and slender figure, she boasts a fantastic figure. Her dark emerald green eyes contrast strikingly with her shock of hair. Whenever Abby dresses up, she still attracts attention. As for me, I'm John Sawyer, and I don't look that bad. I am tall and of decent weight, with sandy hair and blue eyes. We were often told that we were a beautiful couple. As a student, I never had any difficulty finding female companionship, but when I met Abby, I realized that she was the one I wanted to see next to me. For twelve years, I believe that Abby felt the same way about me. We first met in high school and fell deeply in love with each other. Our bond only strengthened during our four years of university studies, which led to the fact that we tied the knot three months after graduation. Abby is not just my true love. She is my soulmate, my everything. Life is unthinkable without her. Although we cherish our two children very much, it becomes difficult to be spontaneous with them. Tonight was supposed to be special for the two of us. We decided to go dancing in the city with three other couples, looking forward to a late evening with drinks. We rented rooms in one of the hotels in the city center. We agreed that my parents would look after our two daughters for this evening. The evening promised to be truly unforgettable, but everything turned out unexpectedly. Upon arrival at the nightclub, I was overcome by a feeling of anxiety, although I could not determine its cause. The women seemed preoccupied with something, and one of the men radiated a sense of complacency. Among these three couples, I particularly liked George and Helen, as well as Bob and Anna. George worked as a software engineer, and Helen ran the household, raising three children. Bob was the owner of his plumbing business, and his wife was in charge of administrative affairs. The only couple I didn't really like were Chad and Thelma. To be honest, I didn't have any problems with Thelma, but Chad seemed unpleasant to me. Despite this, Abby and Thelma were college roommates and maintained a close friendship. Therefore, I had no choice but to tolerate Chad's presence. As far as I understood, Chad was to some extent connected with the film industry. I think he mentioned that he was an agent or something. It turned out that he was not particularly successful, while Thelma held a lucrative position as a representative of a pharmaceutical company. Personally, I held the position of financial advisor at a well-known brokerage firm. At the initial stage, everything was sluggish, but now I have more clients than I can serve in my company. As soon as you reach a certain threshold of clients, you are asked to become a mentor to a new employee and transfer part of your clientele to him. Naturally, I keep the most profitable clients for myself. I've had to make this decision twice before, and it looks like I'm going to have to do it again in the near future. I'm enjoying a thriving career right now. Abby began her professional career as an administrative assistant to Mike Winston, the executive vice president of the regional bank. After the birth of two daughters a year apart, Abby decided to stay at home with them until the youngest, Stacy, went to first grade. Subsequently, Mike approached her one day and offered her a part-time job in connection with his promotion to president. Interested in this proposal, Abby considered her decision. I supported her decision to take advantage of this opportunity. If you suspect that I was wrong to advise Abby to return to work and that she is now having an affair with her boss, Mike, then you are very mistaken. Mike is 62 years old bald and, more importantly, completely devoted to his wife and five children. Even though I felt that something was wrong, I decided not to dwell on it. 
I was looking forward to an evening of dancing with my wife and an intimate night together. While chatting at the event, we met several familiar couples. Regular trips to dances often lead to meetings with pleasant people. We also cross paths with an old college acquaintance, Fred Abbott, and his wife, Brenda. While I was talking to them, Abby and the others came over to our table. As soon as the music started, everyone's attention was attracted by the commotion at the entrance. A crowd gathered, and Brenda began to breathe heavily. What's the matter? Fred asked. Don't you recognize him? Brenda exclaimed. Looking back, I saw an extraordinarily handsome man. He was a little shorter, but his appearance was undoubtedly striking. Fred and I openly admitted our ignorance. This is Brad Talbot, Brenda exclaimed excitedly. He and his fiancée, Rita Summers, are some of the hottest Hollywood stars. Indeed, Fred remarked, turning his neck to look at Brad. I wonder if Rita Summers is here too, Brenda playfully interjected. John, on a scale of one to ten, Rita is undoubtedly in fifteenth place. She slapped her husband's arm teasingly. It's typical of you to think about it. Watching Brad, I noticed that he was one of my wife's favorite actors. I thought about getting his autograph for her. The subsequent events completely stunned me. Brad came over to our table and asked my wife to dance. Without hesitation, she willingly joined him on the dance floor for the next four songs. Annoyed, I returned to the table and sat down in my seat. My wife didn't even bother to ask if I was against her dancing with another man. When the fifth song started, I tried to intervene, but Chad's glass tipped over, and he cut his hand. John, could you help me? He asked. I looked at my dancing wife, and then at Chad. Instead of contacting my wife, I decided to take Chad to the men's room. The damage turned out to be minor, and I helped him wash the wound and wrap it with a paper towel. When I returned to the table, I saw that my wife was leaving with Brad. Hurrying after them, Chad followed me. Once outside, I saw Abby getting into the car with Brad. I started running to catch up with her, but Chad blocked my path, causing me to stumble. Recovering quickly, I demanded, What's the matter with you, Chad? Grinning, he replied, Brad just took your wife for a ride. Soon, Thelma appeared. This is a dream date for Abby, she remarked. Abby confessed to Chad and me that she liked Brad, and we agreed that he would accompany her. That's my wife. I exclaimed, Do you think I don't deserve to be told about this? Chad replied with a grin. Abby said you didn't mind. Just go with the flow. Disappointed, I said. Forget about it. You're going with the flow. Enraged, I punched Chad right in the nose. The sound he broke down with was the only pleasant moment of the evening. Then Thelma started attacking me, hitting me, and trying to kick me. Fortunately, Fred witnessed the unfolding events and came for me. He quickly intervened and separated Thelma and me. He attacked my husband. Thelma began to scream. No, he didn't. Fred replied calmly. You both provoked a quarrel. He was just defending himself. Thelma became worried and dialed the emergency number. The police arrived about ten minutes later and began collecting statements. Fred stuck to his version of events, and I repeated it, emphasizing that Chad had initially tripped me up. The audience gathered during the commotion witnessed how Thelma attacked me. They informed the officers that they saw me trying to run away from her. As a result, Chad and Thelma were detained. When the police left, I felt depressed. When I returned to our table, I met two smiling women. Where is everyone else? Helen asked. Chad and Thelma were arrested for assaulting me. I replied, trying to contain my anger. Abby left with Brad and seemed pleased. I added. It wasn't intentional, Anna said. She should have just gone outside with Brad, taken some pictures and come back. My wife and Thelma didn't reveal the true plan to you, I said, heading for the bar. Fred caught up with me there. Are you going to be okay? He asked. I'm not sure what's going on, I admitted. 
I hope my wife just went for a walk with that movie star and will be back soon. But as soon as she gets back, we need to have a serious talk. Listen, John, Fred interjected worriedly. I don't want to add to your suffering. Brenda informed me that Brad Talbot has a reputation for stalking married women while enjoying conquests. I prayed that Abby wasn't one of his targets, but Fred advised me to prepare for the worst. My heart sank, not knowing what to do next. I assured Fred that I would be fine before I sat down at the table again. I tried to contact Abby on her cell phone, but the call went unanswered and was forwarded to voicemail. When I returned to my seat, the atmosphere was tense. The wives looked contrite, while their husbands grumbled in displeasure. While the other couples were returning to the hotel, I decided to stay, not giving up hope for Abby's return. After waiting for half an hour, I eventually returned to the hotel. I called Abby's phone every ten minutes until three o'clock in the morning. Disappointed and exhausted, I decided to move out and return home. Arriving around four o'clock, I settled down on the couch. I must have dozed off, but the sunlight woke me up at seven o'clock. Abby hasn't returned yet. Since there were no messages from her on my phone, I went to our Facebook page to see if there was any news. Photos have appeared online showing Brad and Abby leaving a nightclub, heading to his residence, and Abby entering his house in his arms. Hollywood websites were full of reports about Brad's recent conquest. Burning with anger, I immediately contacted my lawyer, whose call was redirected to his residence since today is Saturday. At first, he was unhappy, but after learning about the circumstances, he changed his mind. He advised me to wait for Abby to come home and give an explanation. Around 11 o'clock, Abby appeared, smiling broadly. The smile disappeared as soon as she saw my expression. We didn't do anything, she hastily explained. We just talked all night. I understand that I should have consulted with you, but I was sure that you would refuse. You understand my passion for cinema and Brad Talbot. Last night was like a fairy tale. Nothing bad happened, John. My love for you remains unshakable. I stared at her, feeling steam coming out of my ears. I want you to pack your things and go to your parents, I said sternly. Why are you making a big deal out of a molehill? She answered, sounding annoyed and apprehensive. It was just a conversation. There was nothing else. This is an unimportant question, I said through gritted teeth. It's huge for me. I refuse to believe that nothing happened. However, let's assume that nothing happened. You embarrassed me in front of everyone. In any way, you're exaggerating. Abby replied defiantly, folding her hands on her hips. No one outside our circle knows about this situation. Helen and Anna understand that for me. It was just harmless entertainment. You're a fool, I snapped, making Abby flinch. It was the first time I had addressed her in such a tone. The news is everywhere. There are photos of you and Brad leaving the club, heading to his house, and probably photos of you leaving his house this morning. I think our marriage is over. Please pack your things and leave before I make a mistake. Please. John. Abby was begging, tears in her eyes. I love you deeply. I'm sorry I heard you, but there was nothing inappropriate about it. I thought you'd understand that when you found out the truth. We have to find a way to get through this. Think about our daughters. You weren't thinking about them when you left with that arrogant movie star, I hissed. How would you feel if Stacy or Gail did something like that in the future? Abby turned pale at my words and then burst into tears. I'm really sorry, John. I never imagined that everything would turn into such chaos. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. You've never thought about it. I replied, feeling anger rising in me. I needed to get her out of this situation before acting on impulse, so I left her standing there and retired to our bedroom. I grabbed the suitcase and started filling it with her clothes. I can handle it. Abby muttered, and after a short pause, her voice trembled with tears. She slowly packed her suitcase and carried it downstairs. I didn't offer to help. I waited until she was gone, and then I slammed the door. Looking out the window, I saw her put her suitcase in the trunk and bury her face in her hands. 
I wanted to comfort her, but my anger was too strong. About 20 minutes later, she started the car and drove away. I immediately called my parents and told them what had happened. I asked them to keep the girls for a while longer and told them to tell Abby that I had them if she showed up, which they agreed to. Left alone, I thought about the state of my crumbling marriage. I've been going over everything in my head over and over again. Abby insisted that nothing had happened. Could this be true? I wasn't sure, but my gut told me she wasn't being honest. Will I be able to find the strength to forgive her and move on? Perhaps as long as only our friends knew about it, as she claimed, but now that this whole situation has become known all over the internet, I didn't see a way to save our relationship. I hatched the idea of taking revenge on both of them, but I couldn't come up with a plan. I cried for at least an hour, venting my frustration by pounding on walls and doors. I felt completely powerless. Getting revenge on Brad, a famous figure in Hollywood, seemed impossible. Although the divorce would have financial consequences, I was ready to work from home and fight for full custody of the girls if necessary. I'm sure I have every chance, given that I was a more stable parent. The thought that divorce could cause new suffering for my daughters weighed on my heart. When I was making another cup of coffee around one o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rang. So far, my number has not appeared in the press, but I understood that it was only a matter of time. Hello, I replied. This is John Sawyer, and your wife's name is Abby. A woman's voice asked. Annoyed at the prospect of talking to a reporter, I replied curtly, I'm not interested. The woman giggled softly. Okay, I can't stand them either. Who is this? I asked, about to end the conversation. I'm Rita Summers, in a gentle tone, she said. You probably know my fiancé, Brad Talbot. Yes, I know this guy, I replied, feeling impatient to end the conversation. Do you love your wife? Rita suddenly asked. I sighed. No matter what, I still love her, but given everything that has happened, I don't see how we can rebuild our marriage. If I could come up with a solution that would save your marriage and also fix my relationship with Brad, would you be interested? My heart was racing, and I felt the need to sit down and reflect. In the end, I replied, Yes, I want to save my marriage, but I don't know how to do it, I said. Again, there was a gentle giggle followed by a deep sigh. I've loved Brad for a very long time. We have known each other since childhood. He comes from a dysfunctional family, similar to mine. His father was a womanizer, and his mother had a deep dislike for all men, including Brad. She had never shown any affection for him. Despite his best efforts, he never missed her. He had previously dated married women. I think that's how he's looking for the love that his mother couldn't give him. My own family was also dysfunctional. When I was growing up, my mother suffered from alcoholism, and my father abused me. During that turbulent period, Brad became a pillar of support for me, and I cherished him with all my soul. But our relationship ended when he moved to another country after his parents divorced. I lay in tears for several weeks. Our paths crossed again in Hollywood when we both achieved success. Despite knowing about Brad's difficult history, I treated our new relationship with caution. But after the reunion, our love flared up with renewed vigor. During our engagement, he assured me that he had given up relationships with other women. When I asked him about your wife, he insisted that nothing bad had happened. Unfortunately, I cannot confirm any of these statements. Just the thought of breaking up with Brad causes me great suffering. Yes, my wife also claims that nothing happened, I admitted. The prospect of losing her is no less painful. Do you trust her? Rita asked. No, I don't trust her, I replied. I don't trust him either. I know Brad, and it's not like him to invite a woman and do nothing. But I suppose stranger things have happened. Still, I tend to think that something has happened. That's why I want him to understand the pain he caused me, and I would like your wife to feel the same. I'm not sure that this will solve everything, but I hope that we can move forward together with our partners, I said. So far, I agree with this plan, I added. 
But how do we proceed? We will walk this path together, she replied. First, we have to start a conversation with our partners about reconciliation. I'll get in touch with Brad, but I'm not ready to talk to him at the moment. I intend to do it in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, you should consider allowing your wife to return home around the same time. I'll let you know when the time is right. It is important that you keep your distance and refrain from intimacy with her. Why let her come back? I asked. As soon as she gets home, we'll have lunch together, and I'll outline my strategy. There are still a few aspects that I need to work out, she explained. Although I was still not sure about the correctness of this plan, having no alternatives, I decided to act. First, I contacted the parents and informed them that I would pick up the girls in 30 minutes. Then, I called my administrative assistant, Johnny, and informed her that I would be working remotely for the next week. I could tell from her sympathetic look that she was already aware of the situation with Brad and Abby. She kindly offered her help in any necessary capacity. Then, I dialed Abby's parents' number. Her father answered the phone apologetically. He saw the news and expressed embarrassment. When I asked to talk to Abby, she was overwhelmed with emotion, tearfully apologizing and expressing a desire to return home for a conversation. Abby, I said calmly, I think it would be better for us to live separately for a while. I will be working remotely next week. You have obligations from Monday to Wednesday. Let's arrange for you to pick up the girls on Wednesday evening. During this time, we will be able to solve everything. I will take responsibility for them on Sunday evening. Please, John, she begged tearfully. I want to go home. I want us to become a family. Don't you want that too? I thought so, I replied sadly, but now I'm not sure. I'll see you around five o'clock on Wednesday. I picked up the girls and informed them that mom would spend a few days with their grandparents. They had a lot of questions, but their excitement increased when we arrived at Chuck E. Cheese. After a few hours of games and dinner, we returned home. As soon as we entered the house, the phone rang. Not knowing the number, I decided to ignore it, but it kept ringing every five minutes until I unplugged it from the network. Around six o'clock, my cell phone rang. It was Abby. Why don't you answer? She snapped. Because it's just reporters asking about your alleged affair with Brad Talbot, I replied. There's no romance, Abby insisted. I already told you that nothing happened. Well, then you need to inform the public, because of course, they won't believe it, I grumbled. There was complete silence on the other end of the line after which Abby asked that she could talk to the girls. I handed the phone to the girls and overheard their conversation. They enthusiastically told Abby about their day at Chuck E. Cheese. Eventually, Stacy returned my phone, indicating that Mom wanted to talk to me. Abby begged me to come home, but I told her I needed extra time on Wednesday evening. Abby arrived at 4 o'clock instead of the agreed 5. I was a little annoyed that she didn't follow my instructions, but I decided not to pay attention to it. The girls were very happy to see her, and Abby showered them with affectionate kisses. But when she tried to kiss me, I instinctively recoiled. Her expression became painful and tense. Then so be it, she said irritably. Maybe I should just take the girls and leave if that's what you want. I replied calmly, preparing to leave. No, Abby. I hastily interjected, sounding panicked. Let's sit down and solve our problems. The girls started packing for the night when Abby informed them that they were going to visit their grandparents. What should we do now? Abby asked after an awkward silence. I wish I knew the answer, I replied. Right now, I feel offended, confused, and angry. Do you have any suggestions on how to deal with these emotions? I asked. All I can do is apologize, Abby replied, her voice trembling slightly. I made a serious mistake. Please, I beg you, forgive me. I don't want to lose you. Abby, it's not that simple, I replied, leaning back in my chair and crossing my arms. In the eyes of the whole world, I look like a fool. My wife betrayed me, and I didn't do anything. Abby started crying. I never wanted to hurt you, 
I just really wanted to meet Brad Talbot and see his house. I knew you'd be upset with me, but I didn't expect it to escalate into such chaos. Abby, I sincerely want us to get through this, I said, eliciting a fleeting glimmer of hope in her eyes. But I have consulted with a lawyer. In case of divorce, I will seek full custody of the girls. It would be wise if you find yourself a lawyer. I don't want a divorce, she screamed. You can't take my daughters away from me. Abby, I'm not suggesting we get divorced, but we have to prepare for the worst, I clarified. I don't want to hurt you, I said, but given the attention to you, the court may be inclined to grant my request for custody. Please refrain from this, Abby begged. I am ready to do everything to fix our relationship. Why don't we continue our conversations, she suggested. Let's meet for lunch next Sunday when you pick up the girls. If you insist on maintaining custody of the girls, she replied with a note of anger in her voice. I will not tolerate such uncertainty. It's bad for them. If you keep this up, I will immediately start the divorce proceedings. And remember, your reputation is tarnished. I doubt the courts will view you in a positive light, I said. Abby seemed to lose her resolve at this statement. I won't continue. I don't want to get divorced. The second week began, and I returned to my duties in the office. If my assistants reacted to the situation with understanding, then several clients turned out to be less understanding. Two of them found the situation funny and started teasing me. Despite my polite requests to stop, they continued. Disappointed, I announced that I was ending our cooperation and transferring their portfolio to another organization. Despite their attempts to apologize, I firmly stated that our business relationship had come to an end. The news of this decision spread among my clients, and conversations about my wife and Brad stopped. Rita contacted me around two o'clock in the afternoon. Do you have any plans for the evening? She asked. When she was convinced that she wasn't, she replied, Great, because you're joining me for dinner at soon at seven o'clock. A formal dress code. With that, she quickly ended the conversation. I was stunned that Rita informed me about the reservation of a table in the Zoom room, known as the most elite restaurant in the city. A table there usually took a long time, and the prices were prohibitively high. I arrived at 7 o'clock and was escorted to a secluded room at the back of the restaurant. Despite the fact that the table was only for two, the room was extravagantly decorated with a velvet sofa. My thoughts involuntarily turned to what was happening on this very couch. About five minutes later, Rita Summers appeared. When I got up from my seat, I couldn't help but admire her striking appearance. I was sure that when she appeared, the whole restaurant looked in her direction. She was small in stature, with gorgeous blonde hair, warm brown eyes, and an attention-grabbing physique. It was Rita's smile that really captivated me. There was some kind of essence in her that breathed life into you. I couldn't understand why Brad shunned women of her level. May I address you as John? She asked, settling into the seat opposite me. I nodded. And how should I address you? I asked. Rita, of course. She replied with a soft laugh that made me smile. We ordered drinks and talked for a while. I briefly talked about my profession but mostly regaled Rita with humorous anecdotes about my daughters and awkward teenage moments. When the waiter returned for our orders, I hesitated to rush Rita, but I couldn't wait to learn about her strategy. I was fervently looking for a way to save my marriage, but I was at a loss about what to do. After dinner, Rita leaned back in her chair. Let's start with the fact, John. She began with a thoughtful smile, that this insidious Chad Tompkins organized this whole fiasco. He imagines himself to be a famous film agent, but in reality, he's just a pimp, Rita explained. He sets up situations in which unsuspecting people, especially married women, get intimate with movie stars. It's amazing how many people he's trapped into relationships with these celebrities, she continued. You're talking to a person who has experienced this firsthand, she said with a note of disappointment. Although I was not fully aware of Chad's specific role until now, I managed to detain him. Really? Rita's eyes sparkled with intrigue. This is promising news. However, 
Don't be too hard on your wife. Brad is able to charm even the most virtuous people. Your wife is not the first married woman he has deceived, but I am determined to make sure that she becomes the last. Rita said, If I fail to achieve this, then the plan of action I have proposed will at least make him and your wife answer for the suffering they have caused us. I cannot guarantee that after the implementation of my plan either of us will remain in our current relationship, but we will be comforted by the fact that we will not let them escape the consequences of their betrayal," she explained. Rita's compassion for my wife took me by surprise, but I found comfort in the fact that there would be consequences. At that moment, my main concern was how to find out her intentions. What's your plan? I asked. Before I divulged the details, she replied, I would like to say, John, that you are an attractive man with charm. Your wife made a serious mistake by jeopardizing your marriage. If the circumstances had been different, I might have been intrigued. That's very kind of you, but we admit that we live in different worlds, I replied. Besides beauty, you have amazing compassion. Your words are generous. Despite our different backgrounds, my interest in you remains unchanged, she admitted. Thank you. I admitted, curious to learn more about her strategy. I eagerly asked, and what's next? In the next two weeks, I intend to attract you as a client, said Rita. Excuse me, I don't quite understand, I replied, perplexed. As a client, do you mean to get financial advice? Yes, that's right, she said, still not understanding what she was talking about. Rita clarified, I will make some investments through you, but we will have to hold several meetings to clarify the details. In total, I suggest four meetings, two at your office and two at lunch. I'll point out the places. Very good, I agreed although I still didn't understand what the purpose was behind it. I can open an account for you, but the minimum investment amount is $10,000. I intend to invest a much larger amount, she said, and her smile widened. In the meantime, it is necessary that you do not tell your wife that I am your client. You should continue to meet with her to discuss reconciliation. After two weeks, you will allow her to return home, but refrain from intimacy. Subsequently, on October 15th, you and your wife should attend the charity evening reading, which I have been actively involved in for many years. Most people don't know about my connection to this event, which I prefer to do myself. I usually show up every two years, but this year I will be present, and you and your wife will accompany me, Rita said. I was on board even before the charity event started. I said, as far as I understand, Tickets cost $20,000 apiece, and I cannot justify such expenses, I intervened. Rita giggled again, flashing a smile that made my whole body tremble. Don't worry, your tickets will be provided free of charge. Just tell your wife that the client has generously gifted you, she assured. I still can't figure out how this plan can be useful, I admitted, expressing my disappointment. Well, John, Rita explained. Part of the evening entertainment includes an escort auction. An escort auction? I asked again. Rita giggled again and explained, not the type of escort you're thinking of. We are auctioning willing men to women participating in the event. The one who offers the highest price will get the right to put a symbolic collar on the chosen man. Subsequently, men obey the whims of the winners. Rita continued, although most of the participants are not married, there are also married men who allow their wives to bid. In rare cases, a married man may not receive a win from his spouse. As a rule, such married people observe decency because otherwise, their wives, for obvious reasons, will be upset. But this year, a married man will be auctioned at the gala auction, and his wife will not provide a winning bid. Subsequent events will not remain without consequences, she said. I kept a puzzled expression of disbelief on my face. Rita giggled and patted my hand reassuringly. You are a married man put up for auction, and I will be the winner. So all you have to do is rent a tuxedo and buy a new dress for your wife and join me as a guest. Suddenly, everything fell into place. Rita's plan was brilliant. 
She offered Brad and Abby a taste of the suffering that had befallen us, and even though I knew it was just a charade, just spending the evening with Rita Summers, while everyone else assumed the worst would help even things out. It would shift the focus from me as a victim to Brad. In addition, it would allow my wife to understand the pain and humiliation I have experienced. Perhaps this joint experience would help us turn to a psychologist and eventually overcome this ordeal. In the following weeks, time flew by quickly. During Rita's first visit to my office, the staff was full of enthusiasm. Our lunch gatherings took place in inconspicuous restaurants, but the need for such secrecy eluded me. Most of our conversations could have taken place within the walls of my office, but our communication mostly consisted of exchanging jokes. These dinners were amazing and gave me the opportunity to get to know Rita and Brad better. It was obvious that she was genuinely attached to him and would be upset if their relationship broke down, but at the same time, she was ready to break up if he continued his previous behavior. A week before the celebration, I allowed Abby to return home, but at the same time, I made it clear that I would occupy the guest room. Although she looked depressed, she did not dispute this decision. On Wednesday, the day before the gala, I arrived home with tickets, and Abby's eyes were shining with excitement. She was animatedly discussing the celebrities who would be attending the party, and then scolded me for spending lavishly. It didn't cost me anything, I assured her. One of my clients generously provided tickets. I thought it would be a pleasant evening. By the way, I think you should buy a new dress for this occasion, something seductive. Abby's enthusiasm was palpable, and I almost took a liking to her, but a memory flashed through my mind of that ill-fated evening when I expected magic and I was made a fool of. It was necessary for her to understand the depth of my suffering. When we arrived at the place, about 500 people had already gathered. Here in the registration area, there was a table designed for registration for the auction. I noticed a coup of men filling out questionnaires, five of whom were very handsome. I turned to Abby, feigning innocence, and asked, What are you thinking about gesturing at the table? It's a charity event, and we didn't incur any ticket costs. How about I sign up and you bet on me? Abby giggled, though her laugh wasn't as melodious as Rita's. I don't have any money, and I didn't bring my wallet with me because it won't fit in this bag, she explained. Following Rita's instructions, I took cash with me. Here's $11,000. You probably won't have to pay more than $50, but it's for charity. So offer at least $200, I instructed. You're worth the whole $1,000 and more, Abby said with a big smile, getting in line and walking forward. I started filling out the questionnaire, looking at the list. I noticed that about 18 or 20 men had signed up. If I hadn't known that this was all stage, I would never have had the courage to take part. When I was about to leave, the woman at the table asked, have you indicated that you were married? I nodded, and she handed me another document. I assume that your wife is accompanying you, as she has to fill out and sign this form so that you can participate, she informed me. I signaled Abby, gave her instructions, and she quickly filled out the form, unaware that Abby had signed the document without reading it. She agreed that the winning bidder would dictate her actions to me. After completing the formalities, we went to the appointed table. Rita ordered us to sit down with two stars, TV presenters, and two actors from a popular national soap opera. My wife was charmed not only by our table companions, but also by the numerous celebrities who attended the celebration. When the auction started, all the male participants were called to the stage. Smiling at my wife, I headed for the exit. As it turned out, there were 24 participants in total, and I assumed that most likely Rita deliberately left me as the last contender. When I took the stage, the funds raised exceeded $300,000, and I must admit that the bidding process was lively and exciting. Our last participant is a local resident, announced the announcer, a well-known game show host. His name is John Sawyer. He is married, the father of two children. I'm sure his wife is out there somewhere diligently emptying the piggy bank. 
Shall we start the bidding with fifty dollars? I think it's worth at least a hundred, an elderly woman in the front row exclaimed. I grinned and replied playfully, Do you know how to wash dishes, ma'am? I'll wash and dry, she joked, drawing laughter from those present. This is more than my husband can handle, another elderly lady added. The bidding quickly increased from $200 to $500. Soon, I heard Abby's voice. I'm offering $1,000. The crowd burst into applause, and a few moments later, a younger woman raised the bid to $2,000. In the blink of an eye, the bidding jumped to $55,000. I glanced at Abby, who was watching in disbelief. I just shrugged my shoulders in response. An offer of $10,000 rang out from the back of the room, which was quickly followed by another offer of $115,000. If I hadn't known about the organized nature of this event, the escalation of the stakes could have gone crazy. When the bid went up to $25,000, I was seized with a feeling of anxiety. I assumed that a few thousand would be enough for me, but this amount far exceeded my expectations. Suddenly, Rita's voice rang out from the far corner of the room. I'm offering $100,000. There was stunned silence in the hall, not only because of the significant amount of the bet, but also because of the identity of the participant. To the cheers of the crowd, Rita Summers sank into a chair just below the stage. She looked at me with a smile and then, addressing the audience, Rita Summers sank into a chair just below the stage. She looked at me with a smile, and then, addressing the audience, exclaimed, I don't even care if he knows how to wash dishes. The audience burst into applause and jubilation. I found myself blushing deeply. Rita went up on stage, put a familiar collar around my neck, and kissed me gently on the lips. By agreement, we returned to the place where Abby was sitting. Abby looked stunned and speechless. I bent down and kissed her gently on the lips. Then we attended a private screening of the new film, which was attended by Hollywood stars. In my personal opinion, the film was boring, and Rita agreed. Nevertheless, after talking with the director, we both praised the production. After that, the limo took us to a dubious area of the city. I noticed two cars driving behind us, and Rita explained that they were part of her security team. She gestured at two dilapidated houses on the other side of the street, noticing that the one with the porch light still used to be my house, and Brad lived across the street. It was a more respectable neighborhood in those days. The atmosphere remained somewhat harsh. It was almost three o'clock in the morning when we got to Rita's house. Rita said that she had six houses, one in Hollywood, one in New York, one in Florida, two in Europe, and one in South America. This house had three floors, which corresponded to the size of two standard houses. Rita served me a drink in the living room. When I settled down on the couch, I burst out laughing. I wished I had a camera to capture Abby's reaction. Although guilt crept into my soul, it did not completely consume me. Rita settled down next to me, staying close. Rita put her hand on my knee. John, let's be honest. Do you honestly believe your wife's claims that nothing happened? She asked. None of us can provide concrete evidence, but deep down, I believe there was one. I replied dejectedly. That's why the pain doesn't go away. I understand, John, and I'm almost convinced that Brad is having an affair with your wife. Rita said indignantly. I think it's fair to even the odds. With that, she leaned over and kissed me gently. I was stunned by her offer. At first, I assumed that we would retire to Rita's house and sleep separately, which would allow others to believe in our closeness, although in fact, this was not the case. But now, Rita was offering herself to me. It didn't take me long to make a decision. Perhaps if I were a more noble person, I would refuse, but still recovering from the pain caused by my wife's act and having the opportunity to be with Rita Summers, it was hard for me to resist. We kissed passionately on the couch for about twenty minutes. The feeling of intimacy with such an amazing woman was exciting. In the end, she took my hand and led me to her bedroom. Entering the bedroom, Rita began to dance. 
Intrigued from the moment of our first kiss, I watched Rita's dance moves and felt the anticipation in me, reinforcing the desire for an immediate connection. Undressing, Rita led me to her bed. While my wife was mastering the skill, I found that Rita's experience gave me even more pleasure. Perhaps the novelty of the meeting intensified the sensations. At that moment, such differences were insignificant as we neared the climax. I informed Rita about it. The next morning was marked by a special intimacy between Rita and me, characterized by intimate conversations and moments of closeness that contributed to a deep sense of connection between us. Rita's affectionate words and gentle gestures contributed to a feeling of warmth and comfort between us. Rita's affectionate words and gentle gestures contributed to a feeling of warmth and comfort between us. Laughing and hugging each other, we lost track of time and enjoyed each other's company. Our bond deepened as we spent more and more time together, generating a deep sense of trust and intimacy. Rita's gaze conveyed a deep sense of love and significance, accompanied by unspoken promises that even more joyful moments lay ahead. When the morning sun lit up the room, we realized that we had spent a lot of time just enjoying each other's presence. Despite the lateness of the hour, Rita's infectious laughter calmed me down. It was one of those mornings when everything seemed harmonious when you bask in the presence of a person who understands you and cares deeply about you. The joy we received from communication served as a vivid reminder of how pleasant it is to communicate with the woman we love. Rita playfully reminded me that my wife was not worried during my absence and stressed that nothing terrible had happened. I giggled in response, and we went to the shower together. Then we got dressed, and Rita made scrambled eggs for me while we waited for the limo to arrive. During the trip home, I was overcome by a sense of calm. I hoped that, with Abby's willingness, we could begin the path to healing and moving forward. When I returned to our house, I found Abby in tears in the living room. I wasn't sure if you'd come back, she said, her voice full of sadness. The news is full of reports that Rita Summers paid $100,000 for an evening with you. At first, I thought it was revenge, but watching how she treated you, it can be concluded that her investments were a reflection of her sincere feelings for you. Despite these actions, I do not consider you guilty. Do we have a chance to make peace? First of all, Abby, I confess nothing untoward has happened. I said. At first, indignation flashed in her eyes, but then her expression quickly softened. Really? she asked. Rita is my recent client, I explained. She thinks it was a completely justified reaction given Brad's actions towards me. In addition, Rita was a patron of the arts and provided tickets for the gala concert. She usually donates $100,000 anonymously every year, but this time, she decided to make a public contribution to deliver a message to her fiancé. So, I'm right. It really was a means of revenge against Brad. The future of our relationship is in your hands. If you're willing to work on our marriage and attend counseling, I'm willing to do the same. Abby threw herself into my arms, and I kissed her fervently before leading her to our bedroom. Despite feeling exhausted, I found the strength to make love to her. After that, I fell asleep again until my daughters got into bed around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. After a quiet dinner with the girls when they went to bed, Abby and I sat together on the terrace, holding hands. At that moment, I was full of confidence that we could fix our marriage and move forward together. Abby and I turned to a consultant named Wendy for help, who played a crucial role in solving our problems. Surprisingly, Wendy was more strict with Abby than I expected. I thought Wendy, being a woman, would be more understanding about this, but she quickly pointed out that Abby had thought through her affair in advance, and I hadn't. Despite the fact that we both insisted that there was nothing physical, Wendy was skeptical. She stressed that seeking solace in someone other than a spouse is in itself a betrayal. Abby blushed throughout our conversation, and Wendy didn't seem to pay attention to it. Understanding my night with Rita as revenge on her fiancé, which in fact it was, Wendy, of course, did not know about my significant role in organizing the affair. 
Despite this, the consultations turned out to be incredibly useful. Surprisingly, one positive result was extracted from all this turmoil. Abby has stopped loving movies, and she no longer finds pleasure in watching movies on TV. But she is ready to join the girls if they want to watch a children's movie. As for Chav and Thelma, I decided to drop the charges against Thelma, explaining to the authorities that she believed she was protecting her husband. But I continued the accusations against Chad. As a result, he was sentenced to three months in a district detention center. We decided to sever all ties with Chad and Thelma, and Abby is no longer in contact with Thelma. Their relationship has deteriorated significantly, and Abby holds Thelma responsible for almost ruining our marriage. I cannot understand my wife's point of view on this issue. Meanwhile, Rita and Brad exchanged vows at a wedding that was called the Wedding of the Century. The guest list exceeded a thousand people, and the presence of it became a status symbol in Hollywood. Unfortunately, Abby and I didn't get an invitation, but I sent Brad a wedding present, a pair of bull horns. I cut the horns in half and sent them with a note, stay away from my wife, and I'll stay away from yours. I still held a grudge against Brad, but Rita assured me that he found the gesture funny. He even framed the note and proudly hung it in his office. In typical Hollywood fashion, their marriage turned out to be short-lived and lasted only a year. True to her word, Rita, after learning about Brad's infidelity, began divorce proceedings. The breakup was peaceful, and they remained on good terms, but it was still a pity. Rita confessed to me that she genuinely loved him. From what she said about their relationship, it became clear that they shared a deep affection. Unfortunately, this was not enough to save their marriage. Interestingly, Rita is still our client. After opening her account, she deposited a significant amount of $1 million into it. I assumed that after taking revenge, she would close the account, but she decided to keep it. When the account balance reached $2 million, she added $2 million more. Although we have never met in person since that celebration, we regularly FaceTime each other about four times a year to discuss our investments. Sometimes our conversations boil down to the study of life. Rita demonstrates sharp business acumen, showing unexpected conservatism in choosing investments. Her political views remain a mystery to me. Although the quarterly portfolio update lasts about 20 minutes, our conversations often drag on for an hour or two, covering a wide range of topics. After her divorce from Brad, Rita jokingly suggested that she should have chosen me. I waved her off, emphasizing the difference in our experience. Since then, she has been playfully teasing me, not letting me come to my senses. She even jokes that with a good combination of circumstances, she can start a romantic relationship, jokes that she will make a move as soon as she finishes filming and I will be free. As Abby and I approach our 10th wedding anniversary, I can't help but acknowledge the difficulties we faced along the way. Despite all these difficulties, our marriage was just amazing. Looking back, I'm sure that without Rita's help, I could have considered divorcing Abby. Now I can't imagine my life without her. In addition, I want to share another interesting event. Abby is pregnant, and we are looking forward to the birth of our boy. This news filled me with great joy in anticipation of the future. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.